Excellencies, dear colleagues, uh, good afternoon uh, to who is with us at the Basel Rotterdam and Circle Conventions meetings of the Conference of, Par of the Parties here in Geneva. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to who is with us online or is now watching the video of the event. We have the pleasure to welcome you today for a new session of the Geneva Bit Plastic Pollution Dialogues, the second today, which have kept the international community in Geneva and beyond engaged on this topic since the end of 2020, making links with the United Nations Environment Assembly and other international processes. This third series of the dialogues that kicked off in April is organized by the Geneva Environment Network in collaboration with the Basel, Rotterdam and Stockholm Convention Secretariat, the Center for International Environmental Law, the Global Governance Center at the Graduate Institute, IUCN, Norway, Switzerland, and the Forum on Trade, Environment, and SDGs, and the University of Geneva. The session today is co-organized with the International Pollutants Elimination Network, or IPEN, and with the support of uh, the Nexus Tree Foundation, CAP, and BAN. To introduce you to today's event and to actually chair today's event and moderate the event, it's my pleasure to introduce IPEN uh, Programs and Policy Coordinator, Lia Esquillo. Lia, over to you. Thank you, Diana. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, we are so glad you could join us tonight. Allow me first to briefly introduce IPEN and our side event this evening. IPEN, or the International Pollutants Elimination Network, is comprised of over 600 public interest NGOs in more than 120 countries. We work to strengthen global and national chemicals and waste policies, contribute to groundbreaking research, and build a global movement for a toxics-free future. You've probably been hearing um, many of our interventions at the plenary. But this side event, will focus primarily on the transboundary trade in refuse-derived fuel, RDF, you'll be hearing uh, a lot about that, and other similar fuels like processed engineered fuels, which contain a high fraction of mixed plastic waste. You will hear about the Australian government's waste export ban being undermined by legislation allowing PEF exports to neighboring countries. The Australian case will illustrate the lack of controls around this hazardous trade. Further insights will be provided into the trends around RDF imports, trade and production affecting Indonesia and Malaysia, and concludes with the examination of recent plastic waste trade data relevant to the Asian region and the Basel Convention controls. So to cover all these, we will have four presentations to be followed by question and answer. So please hold on to your questions and we will tackle them all at the end. So our first speaker, Lee Bell, is IPEN's Mercury and Pops Policy Advisor based in Australia. Lee has over 25 years experience in POPs pollution research, contaminated sites policy, and technical analysis of industrial POP elimination, POP emission sources. Lee is a member of the Stockholm Convention's BATBEP expert group and recently co authored Plastic Waste Management Hazards with Professor Shige Takada of the International Pellet Watch, which included a review of the plastic waste-based refuse-derived fuels. Lee will discuss waste export bans and the RDF trade. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Leah. Uh, my name is Lee Bell, and I'm the Mercury and Pops Policy Advisor for IPEN. I'll be talking today uh, about the Australian waste export ban uh, and how that's being undermined by exporting waste plastic as fuel uh, into the region. The Australian context around plastic waste export. I'll just give a little bit of history uh, as to what's been occurring in the uh, last few years. So in 2017, uh, many of you will be familiar with China's national sword policy, which was implemented to reduce environmental damage uh, from imported waste into China. 
Waste exporters like Australia relied heavily on China to take the waste and now redirects those waste exports to other countries in Southeast Asia. Post-2017, Australia's low-grade plastic waste exports to Asia that were destined for recycling often ended up dumped, open burned, or used as fuels with minimal recycling. Pops food chain contamination from burning plastic was identified as a result. Import countries began to reject and return Australian shipments of low-grade and contaminated plastic waste. 2019, the Basel Ban Amendment enters into force, preventing OECD countries exporting hazardous waste, including many types of plastic waste, to all non-OECD countries. In 2021 and 2020, uh, in response to neighbouring country waste rejections and tighter export controls, Australia begins to invest in a domestic recycling uh, program and announces a waste export ban, one of the first in the world that we're aware of. <clears throat> right now, refuse-derived fuel exports with high plastic waste content, usually in excess of 30%, but often much higher, for burning in cement kilns as fuel emerge as part of Australia's recycling plan, undermining their waste export ban and potentially breaching the Basel Ban Amendment. Other countries in the region increasingly import, trade and produce these RDF variants to burn in local cement kilns uh, or in other countries' cement kilns. Environmental contamination and carbon emissions from burning plastic waste as fuel has become a growing regional threat. So what is China's national sword policy? Uh, it's a policy in which the country's latest and strictest regulation on imports of solid waste as raw materials is applied. The policy bans various plastic, paper and solid waste, including plastics such as PET, uh, PE, PVC and PS. Uh, and there are many others. It's, it's essentially uh, banning mixed and contaminated plastic wastes in favour of clean and uh, processed plastic wastes. The national sword policy prompted waste exporting countries like Australia to review their domestic recycling infrastructure and other export options. With minimal uh, mixed plastic waste recycling options available in Australia, other export destinations were targeted. We had been relying for decades on waste exports to country with low labour costs and environmental standards for recycling, uh, which meant many export countries like Australia, uh, who based their recycling on export, had minimal domestic waste recycling and structure in place, uh, is especially for plastic waste. The 2019 Basel Ban Amendment enters into force. Uh, plastic waste export controls tighten even further. So if people are interested in uh, an analysis of the Ban Amendment, IPEN has provided a guide to the implications and the next steps involved, uh, and that's available on the IPEN website. Uh, as I mentioned, for decades, Australia had followed an export model of waste recycling. Australians would place their recycling material in their, in their recycling bins, uh, believing it was heading to processing facilities within Australia and being turned into new plastic waste goods. The reality was much darker. The plastic waste that were collected for recycling had been exported to China, Malaysia, Thailand and other Asian countries, including Indonesia. Similar waste from Europe and US also followed this route and from many other countries. Much of this waste is not recycled and was in eventually open burned or used as crude industrial fuel, including in the tofu factory boilers in Tripodo. Uh, IPEN monitoring uh, found extremely high levels of dioxins and other toxic chemicals in soil and chicken eggs in Tripodo uh, and other towns where plastic waste was burned and toxic emissions resulted. You can see those smokestacks. Uh, let's move on. I'm sorry. You can see those smokestacks uh, burning waste. Seems to be advancing on its own. Uh, and uh, black smoke resulting from those. Uh, so the, re the results of this black smoke and fallout from burning plastic uh, was wide food chain uh, contamination. And there's a report there, Plastic Waste Poisons Indonesia's Food Chain, uh, which uh, IPEN uh, has produced, which contains that data for those who are interested. So under pressure from these surging contaminated plastic imports, Indonesia, Malaysia and the Philippines started rejecting those Australian waste shipments. 
uh, a story by the New York Times covered the Indonesian plastic burning issues. Thank you. Uh, and uh, some mistiming on those. And uh, it became a, it became a pol hot political issue in Australia as to what to do uh, about our waste exports. In response to the uh, political pressure that grew, the Australian government at that time, we have a new uh, Australian government now, uh, they reacted and, and was applauded for announcing a waste export ban and announcing massive domestic recycling investment. Uh, there was a $1 billion waste and recycling plan announced to uh, transform the waste industry and a ban on waste plastic exports and other types of waste as well. The recycling focus included investment in refuse-derived fuel and process-engineered fuel. Refuse-derived fuel and process-engineered fuel are basically shredded plastics, paper, timber, fabric, and other combustible waste compressed into solid fuel pellets or bales for burning in cement kilns and incinerators in Asia. These may be exported from Australia as product, uh, i.e. fuel, and not waste, even though they are made of waste. In this form, they may avoid the restrictions of the Basel Convention uh, International Trade and Waste, uh, where they should be classified at least as Y48 due to its high plastic content. However, the Basel Plastic Waste Guidance fails to address the implications of this waste trade. And we're currently uh, dealing with the plastic waste technical guidelines here, and there is very little information available to anyone in that guidance about this particular trade, uh, or even the, the contents of this RDF material. Australia produces more than a quarter of a million tonnes annually for use in Australia uh, and also has plans to significantly expand production and exports into Southeast Asia. Uh, and uh, uh, very soon after these announcements were made, it was quite obvious, uh, sorry, <laughs> that's it. Uh, very soon after these announcements were made, it was quite obvious that there were problems associated with the trade and Reuters conducted an exclusive investigation uh, and Australia came under fire for shipping their plastic waste uh, as fuel to these countries. Australian waste companies, Resource Co and CleanAway have significant plans for RDF and process engineered fuel expansion in the region, uh, which includes establishing factories in other countries to produce the waste in those countries uh, for distribution uh, and in some ways to uh, overcome some of the export issues. So RDF and even solid recovered fuel, which is often made of tyres, uh, and their transboundary movements in Asia are uh, mapped out here in this International Energy Association report. China and India are currently major final, final customers, but Australian countries intend to export more uh, of these materials to countries in the region, uh, and they're certainly targeting the Philippines. A short summary of plastic waste trade from Australia in the year 2021, following uh, both Basel ban amendments and the announcement of a plastic waste ban, a waste export ban, shows that the reality is quite different from what they're claiming uh, the ban would produce. Uh, and so Australia is actually a country that increased its plastic waste exports in 2021 up from 2020. The main destinations remain places like India, Vietnam and Malaysia. And this is in the context of the government uh, making their national ban uh, active in 2021. Another concerning development is this sort of unilateral determination by Australia to consider RDF and PEF as a non-waste that is not subject to these kind of waste export bans or controls. Uh, however, the federal regulators have informed licensed applicants who wish to export the material, they may have to apply for a hazardous waste export license, uh, which seems contradictory. Uh, so RDF and uh, PEF export volumes are also very, very difficult to track uh, as they don't have a specific uh, HS code and fall under much broader plastic waste uh, HS codes, uh, which tend to obscure the actual volumes that are involved. So uh, our view is uh, that with Australian exports of plastic waste to burn in neighbouring countries, um, this issue must come to an end. And we recommend that the exports should be classified as waste shipments and not product exports to clarify the status of these materials and to subject them to the boundary uh, Basel transboundary controls. Uh, RDF and PEF and associated waste used as fuel should be assigned a very specific HS code. So there's trade transparency and the ability to track. RDF and PEF uh, should be rapidly phased out as an un environmentally unsound management practice for plastic waste due to toxic emissions uh, when burned. 
uh, food chain contamination and a high carbon footprint because we can't always ensure uh, that they are actually burned and consumed in facilities that meet the highest regulatory standards. Uh, there is a newly elected Australian government, literally uh, a week or two ago, uh, who can now review uh, this practice and we'll be talking to them and this use uh, and the export with a view to implementing a real waste export ban. And if you'd like to know more about this particular issue, there's a couple of publications that IPEN has available uh, and they're available on the IPEN website and there's a few copies by the door as well. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. For your enlightening presentation. So from your presentation, it's clear now that even if Australia has supposedly a waste export ban, um, Australia actually still exports its waste um, to neighboring countries in the guise of uh, plastic fuel. So let us now move on to the next presentation. We will look at uh, the RDF situation in Indonesia. <clears throat> Joining us remotely is our next speaker, Yuyun Ismawati. Yuyun is the co-founder of Nexus 3 Foundation, an Indonesian NGO which works to safeguard the public, especially vulnerable populations, from the impact of development on their health and the environment. Yu Yun is an environmental engineer and holds a Master, master of Science in Environmental Change and Management from the University of Oxford. She won the Goldman Environment Prize in 2009. Over to you, Yu Yun. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leah. Um, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Good evening. Um, thank you for having me in this session. And as Lee already provided the intro, I'd like to share, uh, the component of this study in Indonesia. Um, so I would, I will need help to move my slide. Thank you. Next, please. Yeah, this is just a quick introduction. Uh, we can skip this part, um, but uh, you can see that uh, we belong to various network. Next, please. So to start with, uh, I just want to share this uh, waste composition uh, of Indonesia. So um, the data in 2020 shows that uh, the composition of the Indonesian uh, waste are mainly uh, coming from households and a traditional market which dominated by organic waste and on the right side is um, compositions based on um, the type of waste uh, and uh, food waste and also uh, wood uh, branches and leaves are um, uh, also a big uh, part of the Indonesian waste and we can see that plastics are uh, about 17% and then cardboards and others um, are the rest. So with, uh, within the Indonesian uh, government, there are policies and regulations related to RDF and waste management. Uh, I'm sorry, it's a bit complicated, but uh, you can see the structure from the national law and then uh, government regulations and then ministerial degree, uh, regulations until at the bottom is the local government regulations. Uh, at the local level, the government uh, regulations, uh, sub-regional regulations that already ban several uh, plastic packagings. Um, and at the national level, also, there are regulations to um, this and strategies to reduce um, plastic waste and manage it. And also recently, the government uh, announced the um, requirement for FMCGs and retailers to submit their roadmap to reduce plastic waste uh, about 30% by 2030. However, this strategy also linked to the energy uh, strategy, which uh, by 2025, uh, the government is planning to have mixed energy uh, sources. Um, and as you can see, the compositions on the right side um, is shifted a little bit, uh, not heavily relying on oil and coal. Uh, and they would like uh, to increase more from the renewable energy and new energy sources. Which, if we see further, uh, the compositions of renewable energy also consisted of um, 
biomass. And biomass here uh, can be in form of pellets and briquettes uh, from uh, biomass. And interestingly, plastic is considered as a new sources of energy and mixed waste uh, because we have problem um, with a waste management system. <clears throat> And uh, looking uh, specifically into the uh, plastic materials and plastic industry in Indonesia, uh, about 50% um, of the virgin materials of, to make plastics in Indonesia are actually imported. Although Indonesia also produces a lot of virgin materials, but um, well, it, it's still considered uh, a low um, capacity. And uh, to produce plastics, um, producers also imported plastic waste uh, to mix it with uh, virgin materials. However, the, when they arrived in Indonesia, the waste um, um, inside the containers are mixed uh, like this, including uh, in the paper bales. So you can see one of the containers uh, was coming from a paper company. And inside that paper bales are uh, uh, a lot of uh, plastic packaging, especially with flexible packaging. Um, so Indonesia also followed these uh, references about uh, the type or grade of RDF, uh, which is um, mainly RDF type five that uh, used uh, widely for uh, especially coal fire power plants and uh, cement kiln. Um, and based on this uh, reference, um, a lot of projects are now pushed into uh, towards this direction of uh, creating or producing RDF pellets and briquettes. So, as I mentioned earlier, that the type of waste in Indonesia are mainly uh, organic, and this is uh, the table presented here uh, from the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Resources when they try to identify the new sources of renewable energy from biomass. And uh, we can see this, uh, the potential from every island uh, that um, the municipal waste also identified at the bottom. But actually, if they are looking for the biomass uh, sources, it will be more from agriculture, uh, will be better than the municipal waste. So, uh, to support the Indonesian government strategy to um, uh, on waste management by 2030, by 2025 and until 2030, um, the government also set uh, the target to have RDF plant about 40 until 2030, and then uh, waste to energy plant about 23 plants. And uh, to support this, um, there are several national standards has been issued, especially uh, standards related to RDF bio pellets and then briquettes. And uh, these, uh, we call it SNI. So these SNI are mainly voluntary. So actually it doesn't matter um, whether the producer will follow any of this SNI or not, because it's a voluntary standard. And uh, more than 20 coal fire power plants are now uh, scheduled to have RDF um, as a coal firing uh, uh, mechanism or alternative fuels. Um, and many of them used um, various things of, of biomass. And some of them used RDF um, as the uh, coal firing, uh, especially for um, coal fire power plants that um, belong to or, or runs by the um, PLNs or the Indonesian power. Um, the problem with this is that um, if we are talking about uh, climate, um, so replacing coal with another fossil fuel, I don't think it's compatible because it's still the same thing, uh, issue, em issue the emission of uh, uh, CO2 emissions. Uh, moreover, the the emissions will be more toxic because um, they will have uh, a mix of uh, plastics in in the RDF. Um, for cement kiln, we call it uh, they call it co-processing, not co-firing, because all of this mixed waste will be burned together with the limes and other uh, uh, materials to produce cement. 
And um, as we know that the uh, dioxins monitoring are uh, very challenging in developing countries, including in Indonesia. Uh, however, this is also included in the target of the thermal substitution rate, 15% um, until 23% by 2025. So, so many um, state-owned companies are now being pushed to have this thermal substitution rate, meaning that they can replace or they should replace coal with other materials uh, or RDF uh, from biomass or from anything else. Um, um, to achieve this, uh, however, the cement companies and also the coal fire power plants have to uh, increase their uh, capital uh, investment um, to accommodate uh, different kind of materials being burned. Um, and uh, they have to collaborate with the suppliers uh, to fulfill uh, the capacity to replace 5%, one until 5% of coal. Um, to support this, um, the government also has the Ministry of Environment uh, regulations on the emission standards. Um, for and due to lack of the capacity of local um, laboratory to analyze dioxins, the government then set the standard to analyze uh, to monitor uh, PCDs, um, dioxins, and furans only every four years. And this is for cement industry that use and um, produce cement every day and use the fuel also every day. Um, uh, but for cement kiln that um, uh, co-firing hazardous waste, uh, they have to be measured at least uh, once a year, depending on the permit that they obtained. And furthermore, we have heavy metals issues released from the cement kiln emission. So, um, there are several uh, uh, monitoring standards that need to be tightened. So at the local level, we also have uh, RDF now, um, a lot of them now, actually small scale, uh, to process mixed waste and waste residues from um, communities and, and um, residential areas. And some of them are supported by uh, FMCGs like uh, Unilever or Danone. Uh, and in this slide, uh, I just presented the case that we have in Bali uh, where household waste being processed and um, processed to become uh, RDF, like the picture in the middle. And this RDF um, pro uh, production is really, really, um, Acidic because I went there and then I could feel the the the, the smoke uh, acidic uh, that I inhaled and the community surrounding that area and uh, the facility of MRF also complaining uh, uh, many many times and um, interestingly Danone has just admitted uh, to Fera uh, to have plastic credit um, for. Uh, the, the amount of waste that they processed in this facility. We have tried to communicate with uh, Vera about the standard for certifications of plastic credit, because if it's going to be burned or um, uh, especially in boilers or small scale facilities uh, for laundry or even for barbecue, it's scary uh, because there is no emission control in that small uh, uh, units. Um, so, uh, with this evidence and claim complaints from the communities, we tried to communicate with uh, Vera, which is the company who um, uh, provide the certifications, and also with Danone. Uh, it's an ongoing process now, but since this project launched last year, um, this become the model now, which is uh, scary for us because it's uncontrolled, but it's widely supported. So. So as we try to understand uh, how we uh, should improve um, and the government should improve the waste management system, we have this issue of uh, plastic waste importation by, uh, um, by plastic companies, but also by paper uh, companies. And uh, we've seen this, uh, the number of plastic waste imported by Indonesia decreased by 2021, but this is not fin final uh, number yet because I believe uh, the report has not been 100% complete, but we could see that the number of plastic uh, waste importation declining, although 
um, the type of um, uh, plastics also we can see on the right side uh, as changing. And uh, we tried to see um, um, the entry points for PEF to Indonesia uh, using several uh, uh, HS code. In this case, um, using uh, 3825, which is municipal waste, where we could see also in many other countries uh, being used to uh, send uh, the, uh, the plastic waste or the RDF. Well, in other countries also, uh, different codes has been used, uh, like uh, 400, 400, or 700-700, uh, you know. So there are different uh, HS code being used to uh, transfer or to uh, trade uh, RDF. And in this case, um, in 2020, it was the highest one was from Australia. Yeah, so this is 369. Uh, that's also used as the entry point of um, uh, PEF. Um, yeah, so we can see this data, uh, but it's it's difficult because they are all scattered. So we hope that with the Indonesian government strategy to support RDF and with all the subsidies and so on, uh, we hope that uh, the Indonesian government could allocate the fund. Uh, more to improve waste management system as a whole um, and also zero using zero waste approaches um, and then we would like to see more uh, clarity in the uh, prohibitions of importations of waste uh, for alternative fuel uh, under the code uh, 38 uh, hs code 3825 or uh, 360 and uh, 1690, 690, and uh, implement the Basel Amendment effectively and strengthen the border. Um, uh, because at the moment we haven't seen any translations of uh, the Basel Amendment in Indonesia. And then uh, emission standards have to be strengthened and, and strengthened. And uh, no RDF productions and use for small scale or residential areas uh, should be allowed. Uh, increase the capacity of laboratory, especially to analyze POPs, and then publish the roadmap uh, of circular economy for paper and plastic industry. Uh, so we will know what's going on. Um, and then the voluntary uh, SNI is useless unless they are mandatory. And uh, we would like to see no subsidy uh, given to RDF plant or waste to energy plant. Um, thank you for the opportunity. So looking forward to have the discussion. Handing it over to you, Leah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you again also very much, Yu Yun, uh, for making time for us. And we hope that your connection remains strong so you could be with us until uh, the Q&A. Next up is Mageswari. Uh, to share with us this time the situation of RDF in Malaysia, you know, one of the destinations of the Australian uh, waste. Mages is a senior research officer in the Community and Environment Section of Consumers Association of Penang and is also an honorary secretary with Sahabat Alam Malaysia, or that's Friends of the Earth Malaysia. In the past few years, Mageswari has been working on the issue of plastics pollution, toxics, and waste trade for both organizations. Mages, you have the floor, please. Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, so I work with the Consumers Association of Penang. We are based in an island, uh -huh. and this organization was established in 1969. Um, what we do is we work on consumer rights and also on environmental issues. So in terms of this work that we had done with IPEN, we um, actually studied on what is happening uh, in terms of uh, process engineered fuel coming into Malaysia. Okay, um, so through our studies, um, we found that there, there was already an RDF plant, which was developed in 2006. Prior to that, the scientists and also the engineer was saying it's this is the one-off plant, it's really it can solve our municipal solid waste problem. Yeah, uh, it can divert the waste from going to landfills and what we do. Um, so real big hoo-ha about it and then um, convince the government 
Yeah, and finally, they were given the right to um, build the develop, uh, to develop the plant. Uh, so it was developed in 2006 uh, with a capacity of 1,000 tons per day uh, and 8.9 megawatts uh, electricity. So this is a pilot uh, project. But just a year later, we had been um, we were getting complaints from um, people in the surrounding area saying that there's complaints of order. Uh, waste that was supposed to go in, so it was sent to the plant, but then it was sent out again because it they could not operate fully operate. So uh, when uh, they were questioned, said you know it's like running at seventy percent capacity, yeah. And uh, finally, it actually um, just failed. It was a failed project. Uh, there were a lot of problems, and um, when we were studying what's happened to it, we found that it was finally shut down in twenty fifteen. The company had also gone bankrupt. So this was a real failure uh, in terms of an RDF plant in Malaysia. Um, next, what we did was uh, we were studying, um, due to, uh, we were investigating what's happening. Of course, um, um, Malaysia was the uh, top base dump site, you can say, uh, that was in 2018. Uh, and we got waste from all over um, the world uh, after China closed its doors to waste imports. Um, and um, so we have we had a lot of uh, uh, reporters coming in and um, those uh, reporters on 60 Minutes Australia and also other media came and uh, they opened the uh, containers of plastic waste, supposed to be clean plastic waste. When they opened, it was like stench yeah? Yeah. because it was contaminated with like you may have your um, Petra packs or this uh, multi-layered packaging, but there was still milk in those packaging. So it was uh, really bad. So this was one instance, yeah? Uh, and Malaysia, uh, as Lee had already mentioned, they repatriated the waste back to Australia. Um, okay, so we were still studying on what's happening. And um, um, as Yu Yun had also pointed out, uh, it was kind of difficult for us to find out what exactly was coming into Malaysia. Um, so HS, uh, because there are so many uh, codes, yeah? So HS 3915 is for the plastic waste that was coming in. And then for uh, RDF, it was 3825. And uh, uh, 3825 is municipal waste, yeah? Uh, for RDF itself, it's 3825.10. Uh, but waste was also coming in as processed engineered fuel. Uh, that was, um, so we were looking at the Singapore customs, and uh, that's what Malaysia also had followed, 3606.90.10. And um, when we were looking at the data, um, so you can see it's not that clear. Um, Indonesia was also import, uh, exporting waste to Malaysia, and uh, you and I were investigating, so what was Indonesia exporting to Malaysia? It was, uh, they were exporting spent bleaching earth, so this is a, pro, a byproduct from oil palm processing. So Malaysia and Indonesia um, large oil palm, um, uh, uh, they have large oil palm plantations and processing industry. And so these were also dumped indiscriminately. Yeah? Uh, the, the importers had dumped it because they were not able to process it. It was supposed to be processed to biofuel or biodiesel. Yeah? Um, and, um, and you can see that um, it, the one in blue was Australian uh, waste, which was imported to, to Malaysia, but it had reduced. Uh, why was it reduced? Uh, we were, yeah, this is uh, a clearer, oh, sorry. Yeah, clearer copy. Um, 3915 plastic waste was coming in and it is, um, uh, in 2018, it was 44,000, uh, 44 million uh, kilogram. Uh, it reduced in 2019 because Malaysia had um, stricter uh, controls on the imports, uh, but then it's slowly increasing, as uh, Lee had also pointed out. Yeah, uh, if you look at HS 360, uh, 3606.90 for process engineered fuel, 2014, 2015, it was coming into Malaysia, but it stopped in 2016. Why did it stop? Because we managed to stop it. Yeah, uh, we had intelligence from the company that was importing waste that um, this company was using um, a different code. It was actually waste that was coming in. Yeah, uh, but they said this is solid fuel. And so in the customs code, it was solid fuel that was coming in. Uh, 
uh, and uh, we um, lodged an official complaint to the Malaysian government. So the customs department um, said, yeah, yeah, this is not fuel, this is based because the type of thing was coming in was uh, shredded uh, plastic waste. Yeah? And also, um, fortunately, when the Department of Environment went and did an inspection in the factory, they found electronic waste. So electronic waste is hazardous waste. So, uh, so the government had some uh, okay reasons to repatriate the waste back to Australia. Um, so we were successful, and uh, the government also decided that you know there should not be any more imports of this kind of uh, um, <laughs> uh, you can feed stocks, yeah, feed stocks, which was uh, being set as fuel. Um, so we also had a demonstration in front of the. Uh, factory. Uh, it's called Resosco Asia, which Lee had also um, had mentioned. Resosco is an Australian uh, company which had which has uh, plants in Malaysia and also had started plants in Indonesia. Okay, um, so we were successful in doing that. Uh, and so the next question is Australia banning waste exports. Lee had also mentioned, and we were really looking into what's uh, happening. Uh, and you can look at the. Uh, plastic rules here, yeah? uh, you can see. So you can no lang longer able to export mixed waste plastics, but you can <laughs> export um, materials which are processed as process engineered fuel. Mm. So it is still plastics because PEF is like at least 30 to 40 to 50% contains plastic waste. So this is still coming in. So this is how it looks like, yeah? The processed, uh, processed engineered fuel looks like this, yeah? So it's coming in in another way, and then um, it's not only plastic waste. Okay, tires are also coming in. Tires, yeah. Uh, so it is mentioned tires that can be exported from Australia. Um, so if it's processed into crumbs or shreds, then it can be considered as tire derived fuel and it was still coming in to uh, our countries here, yeah, to Indonesia. I'm not sure whether it was also being brought by uh, Philippines. Yeah, and uh, what happened was um, we did not, we were not, uh, we thought that there was like no more um, waste which was coming in as fuels, but uh, there was this uh, air, uh, this uh, stockyard which was burning in flames. And what uh, after investigation by the Malaysian government, we found that it was waste tire, which was exported uh, from Australia, and it was meant to go into cement kilns in Malaysia. Yeah, so it, it was, uh, it went uh, into flames. So uh, this is like where waste tire, uh, which is exported to Malay uh, from Australia goes to Japan, Korea, Philippines. Um, yeah, so that is what's happening. <laughs> Okay, uh, so what is Malaysia's policy? Uh, so the um, resource go because they are not able to uh, import any more waste. What they did was they are now locally sourcing waste. Yeah, and um, and you can see there's a picture there. This is a picture of uh, a waste dump. This was a, a plastic waste which was imported in 2018 and it was just dumped. Yeah, on a dump site because not all plastic can be recycled. Yeah, so whatever residual waste was uh, dumped here. And um, this company, Resourceco, um, convinced the uh, Malaysian government, we will clean up the waste for you because they needed waste. They didn't have enough waste. Their uh, capacity is 100,000 tons of uh, waste to be processed uh, in a year. So they didn't have enough waste. Now they are sourcing uh, for waste. So they offered to clean up the waste for the government. So the government was thinking, okay, all right, fine. Yeah, sure. we're doing it for free because if not, who's gonna pay for it? It's not the exporters who are paying for, to clean up. So this seemed to be a good idea for the government and uh, they agreed. Yeah. Um, okay, next. Next slide, okay. So uh, these are types of waste that is being processed yeah, to fuel. Um, we visited the company. You can see a picture of this uh, black 
shiny thing. These are actually electronic waste, also has plastic components. These are shredded. Yeah, and and then these are all mixed. You can see the um, mix of the excavator there, which is mixing it. And you have they have also uh, started using textile waste. Yeah, yesterday we were listening to what's going to happen to textile. So this is what's happening in Malaysia. Textile waste is also being mixed into the uh, process engineered fuel, um, the fuel mix, and uh, this is being burnt in cement plants. So this is the cement plants. We have nine uh, plants in uh, next like this. Mm -hmm. Nine cement plants, um, which is co-processing process engineered fuel or tire derived fuel or um, uh, refuse derived fuel and also scheduled waste. And uh, this scheduled waste is uh, um, sourced locally. And uh, next slide, please. Malaysia also has the guidelines on co-processing uh, in terms of emissions monitoring. You know, this uh, cement plants also have hazardous uh, uh, toxic gas emissions, but all these heavy metals, HCL, um, uh, dioxins and furans, they only have to um, monitor those emissions minimum once per year. So under our clean air, clean air regulations, it's only twice a year. So what's happening on the other days of the year? Yeah, we wouldn't know. Yeah? So if they are going to test on that particular day, they will have the proper mix of uh, uh, waste to be tested and then and also in terms of the emissions. So we do also have uh, continuous uh, emission monitoring systems. Okay, so uh, what we're saying, it, all this doesn't work. Yeah, our demands um, to prevent dumping, we need to end waste colonialism, stop waste trade, ban trade of uh, waste-based fuels, these are the feedstocks, ensure full traceability and uh, transparency of waste shipments. For now, we are not really able to check <clears throat> what exactly is coming in because they use the different HS codes and there's also fraudulent um, uh, reporting, the declaration in terms of the bills of lading. So we really need uh, uh, transparency. And also uh, in terms of uh, monitoring and enforcement measures that has to be taken to stop this digital waste trade. Yeah, uh, because our customs department, they are not able to check all the co uh, containers that are coming in. Yeah, um, it's really impossible. So they will have to be tipped off in terms of what is coming in. Yeah, then only they can open up. Yeah, we do have scanners, but the scanners also break down. Yeah? So uh, this is really impossible. So to solve all this problem, what we're saying is just stop waste trade. All the countries should take care of their own waste. Yeah, and, um, and not only in terms of the waste, we need to also prioritize uh, reduction and um, don't go for these false solutions, cement plants, or we're using coal-fired power, uh, power plants, saying that, okay, we are going to reduce um, uh, using fossil fuels yeah, for our climate actions. So these are all the false solutions. Um, and we have also recently um, uh, submitted a memorandum to the Malaysian government to stop yeah, um, co-opting plastic-based imports, which are repackaged as feedstock. So we are awaiting response from them. Thank you. So thank you very much, um, I guess, for your val valuable, albeit very disturbing inputs. Um, our final speaker is uh, Jim Pocket. He is the executive director of the Basel Action Network based in uh, Seattle, Washington. Jim has been personally um, involved um, in the Basel Convention since its adoption in 1989. And since that time, BAN has been at the forefront of investigations, reporting and actions no? to, to end the exploitative trade in e-waste, obsolete sheep, ships, and plastic um, wastes. For his presentation, um, Jim will help us understand no, RDF within the purview of the Basel Convention and how we could possibly uh, get out of this hazardous trade. Over to you, Jim. Thank you, Leah. Yeah, so when you've seen and heard what you've just heard, we'd like to think there ought to be a law, right? Mm -hmm. And that law is uh, having its meeting right now, Basel Convention. <clears throat> and we are going to explore now 
you know, what the relationship is with RDF and the Basel Convention. The reason we need to explore, if you look at the convention, you will not find the words refuse derived fuel anywhere, not in any of its annexes. Such a prominent waste, and it's an emerging waste stream that we're going to have to do something about that. But with the convention we've got, let's think about <clears throat> where it really sits. So the burning question is, does RDF escape Basel Convention controls, or can we say it's controlled? And so we'll look at what is meant by control in the Basel Convention. Basel Convention doesn't control all trade. It doesn't even control all waste trade. So what it does control is hazardous waste, which are listed in Annex 8, Annex 1, and Annex 3. I think I got it missing one. Oh. So the Annex 7, that's a different, different Annex. Or they can be other ways on Annex 2. Now, there are differences. The primary default control mechanism is prior informed consent. Hazardous waste, however, is impacted by the Basel Ban Amendment. Other waste is not. So it'll be impacted by a ban when it's going from OECD to non-OECD, for example. So there are two ways to fall outside of controls then. You can declare your material as a non-waste. You can say, this is not really a waste. This is a product. It's a commodity. Uh, so therefore, you're outside of the scope of the convention. The other thing you can do is you can say it's a waste, but it's neither a hazardous waste nor an Annex 2 waste or other waste. Um, so the big questions here that we have to look at with re this respect to this particular waste stream are, is, is RDF a waste? And if so, is it a hazardous waste? And if not, is it on Annex 2 as another waste? Those things aren't answered in the, somewhere in the affirmative, we're in trouble. Um, so the que first question is, is it a waste? Wastes are defined as substances or objects that are disposed of or required to be disposed of. Disposal is important, as you can see in this definition. Uh, it's linked to the, word, to the definition of waste very directly. So disposal is defined as materials or objects going to any of the operations on Annex 4. There's recycling operations, there's final disposal operations, but that is the way we define the scope of the Basel Convention with Annex 4. So we got to turn to Annex 4. And when we go to the very beginning of the second part of Annex 4, we see, aha, R1, use as a fuel. So on the face of it, this would appear to clearly be a waste. And in fact, in the EU, um, they have put it in their waste catalog as 1912-10 combustible waste refuse derived fuel. So they actually use the term. So the EU is no problem calling it waste. So if I think we're safe and say it's a waste, but there are countries that are starting to adopt this criteria called when waste ceases to be a waste. And the EU has done this, uh, and it's very concerning because it is a way that on a national level, a country can say, okay, it might be listed in Basel, but we think it's reached a position or has been processed to a point where we're not going to call it a waste anymore. And they can probably do that at the national level. Uh, Basel doesn't have this kind of criteria. That's why it has to be done at a national level. Uh, countries can decide that waste, once they're processed and made into RDF, cease to be a waste. And I'm not quite sure if Australia has been so bold to say that's what they're doing. It seems like their policy is a bit of a muddle mm -hmm. at the moment, but I, this is the danger. This is what they would do. They would say that the processing that we're doing makes it uh, no longer a waste. So let's look at hazardous waste uh, because Waste is not enough, remember, it's got to be either hazardous or on Annex 2. And hazardous waste, you can look at Annex 8, and that is a list of waste presumed to be hazardous that are based on the real fundamental test of Article 11A. Um, and that 11A is, does the material contain an Annex 1 hazardous constituent and at the same time possess an Annex 3 hazardous characteristic? Well, I looked at Annex 8, and I can assure you, like I told you, it's not there. RDF is not listed on Annex 8. So we have to revert to this uh, definition, Article 11A. So we look at this a little closer. Uh, looking at RDF, you know, like I said, is not found on Annex 8. 
but uh, does it have a hazardous constituent with an Annex 3 hazardous characteristic? Well, how the heck can you know? This is the unique thing about waste collected from municipalities or commercial waste. We don't know what they threw in that dumpster. We don't know if there's a load of pesticides in there, heavy metals, electronic waste. At any given point in time, RDF could be very hazardous. You just don't know. Um, so if the RDF had heavy metals, pesticides, then yeah, but who's going to know? So this waste is derived local pickups. We really don't know what people throw in their garbage at any given time. So to really have true knowledge, you would have to have constant testing of every batch. Uh, that isn't happening, folks. Uh, so no certainty then for RDF without extensive and constant testing. So when the convention was formed, that was one of the reasons why Annex 2 was created. The household waste and residues from household waste, nobody knew that whether they're hazardous or not. So they said, we still have to control this because they could be at any given time. So they created this Annex 2 which uh, will give controls, but not the full control of hazardous waste. So when we go into Annex 2, which now has new importance, uh, because this is looking like more and more where things will end up for RDF, we can very plainly see we have waste collected from households. But some might argue it's not always collected from households. We can make our RDF from production waste, from commercial sources, and then we can step aside from that Y46 definition. Not making me feel good. Uh, some might argue that RDF has been manipulated and proportions of waste changed, so it's no longer waste collected from households, even if it was originally. That's pretty scary. So other ways, let's keep going. If it's not Y46, then it could be the new Annex 2 listing for plastics, Y48, which is mixed and contaminated plastics. Ah, that makes me feel a little bit better because as Naga said, this stuff has 50 to 60% of plastics in it usually. Um, that's where the color value comes from. That's why they can burn this stuff. It is a form of fossil fuel. But some might really argue that RDF is really not a plastic waste. It doesn't look like a plastic waste. It's something very different. So a national government could interpret it that it's not a Y48 waste. So the cold hard facts after all those burning questions have been lighting us up here is that is it a Basel waste? RDF is fairly clearly a waste at global level, but countries at a national level can twist that and say it's no longer. Um, so again, they might say it's been processed and thus ceases to be a waste, so it's now a product. And unless you can prove it, it's likely not to be considered a hazardous waste. Unless you can actually go, aha, we, we've seen that every one of these has heavy metals, pesticides, what have you in it. And it may very well fall through the cracks of Annex 2, therefore. There's no slam dunk that RDF is on Annex 2. So the current ambiguity is ripe for exploitation. We're gonna to have to do something about that ambiguity. So my recommendations, what the heck, um, is that RDF should be nominated by a party for entry into Annex 8, or at the very least, Annex 2. And then once we do that, we can write a guidance document warning people about all the, the problems when you're burning this plastic, you're, you're creating serious problems. There could be PVC in there. There's brominated flame retardants. This is all going to turn into dioxins. And at the local level and in neighborhoods in Indonesia, Malaysia, where have you. So people need to be alerted and should be a guidance document to that effect. Um, people should cease the caveman mentality, as I call it, of burning waste. Even if they're not hazardous, even if it's the old, right now we're living in a climate crisis. Don't want to put carbon in the atmosphere. We've got to stop the idea of burning waste. Full stop. I don't care what you're talking about, whether it's rice hulls or whatever. You don't want to be burning stuff anymore. Uh, and countries and local governments should begin to pass measures to forbid the production of RDF and other waste burning methods and operations and products. It's not environmentally sound management. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Jim, uh, for your very informative uh, presentation. Um, we will now open the floor for open forum. So if you have questions, just please um, speak up in cloud so we can hear you and uh, state your name and country perhaps. And if you have a particular speaker you want to direct your question to, please also mention their name. Um, before we go to uh, the questions, let me also introduce to you first. So the cases you heard um, tonight, you know, so the Australia, Indonesia, Malaysia, and actually also the Philippine experience, my home country, um, um, is subject you know, of uh, a research that IPEN published just early this year, you know, um, last March. So we have a copy of the executive summary of the research. Um, we have copies there at the back. Please feel free to get one. And the the full research is available um, in our website. So, do we have some questions for our speakers? Those online uh, watching us can also ask their questions. Yes, sir. Yeah, I am Dr. Zagam Abbas from Pakistan. As you mentioned that there is a no specific guideline on RDF and specified HS code for the transportation from one country to another country. So as you mentioned in many examples from Malaysia and Indonesia that plastic waste in the form of RDS, RDF is coming. So is there any regulatory measures being adopted in uh, Malaysia and Indonesia that how you can control these type of waste which have no HS code and under that uh, RDF uh, more than 30% plastic waste which is uh, already controlled uh, under the category of uh, Basel Convention. So uh, this is my point that how can we take the uh, national measure to control this RDF uh, from developed country like you mentioned Australia to the developing country. Thank you. Who wants to answer? Jim, Jim. Just starting. Okay. <laughs> uh, of course, we want to see it happen in Basel because I think that will give cover to a lot of national governments to say, oh, Basel, we are a party, we are obligated. Mm -hmm. So it will shut down a lot of arguments and fighting in the capital for other countries that Basel will take a stand on this. But we do have the ban amendment. And I think you need very strongly, this is an initial strategy, to so say this is absolutely either Y48 or Y46. And while we have the ban amendment doesn't apply to Annex 2, we're going to make it apply to Annex 2. So this is actually what the European Union has done, as well as Switzerland and Liechtenstein. When they enacted or implemented the Basel ban amendment, they said we're going to include Annex 2 as well. That is a, is a strategy for you to, um, you know, make this clearly part of the ban amendment. And of course, you gotta, gotta ratify that ban amendment. <laughs> Anybody else have anything on that? I would just like to make the point that uh, there is also the process of testing. Uh, in customs importers uh, can do some analysis of the material that's coming in. And uh, as we know, uh, households use a lot of different products uh, and, uh, uh, if you use, if you're importing something like processed engineered fuel, it, it may have some sort of separation of some of the hazardous materials out of it. Uh, but it's still very difficult to remove things like PVCs and uh, broken computer plastics that might contain brominated flame retardants and so on. So um, you can make a determination at national level after some sampling uh, as to whether you consider it uh, to have this, the characteristics that constitute hazardous waste and you can uh, prohibit the further imports from those uh, exporting countries on that basis. Uh, so, um, you know, all countries can control their own borders uh, for these types of wastes, and uh, you can unilaterally, unilaterally declare it a hazardous material subject to some testing. And you can also go the other pathway, which is to require uh, laboratory certificates from the exporters demonstrating that there is no hazardous material before it ever leaves the country of export uh, towards your country and place the onus on the exporting country to spend the money to do the analysis and to demonstrate that on a uh, shipment by shipment basis there's no hazardous material there. Thank you. 
Thank you, sir. Yes, just a follow up to your explanation. Um, how do you know that the exporter is telling you the truth? <laughs> because maybe as a developing country, because oh, okay, let me start by introducing myself. My name is Charles Ikea from Nigeria. I work uh, with the Federal Ministry of Environment, and we have um, problems you know, with this RODF. We are being inundated by request, you know, for for us to allow um, imports, you know, of RODF into the country. And we have this uh, dilemma of uh, knowing what the composition is. One, we don't allow plastic waste into the country. Then it's under the guise of RUDF, you know, pressure is being mounted on us. Uh, this is no longer waste. It is um, it's for, for fuel um, energy purposes. So, and we don't have the capacity to test to analyze these products. We request for material data safety sheets. Of course, it is provided. We were not comfortable because it's possible that we're not being told the truth. And so what do we do? I, I, I completely agree with your position, which is that uh, I'm very cynical about uh, waste exporters conducting their own testing and telling you what might be in their material. Uh, independent audits could be provided uh, by third parties, um, national uh, auditing agencies of some sort that can do the analysis in the country of export. Uh, but I wouldn't, I, I certainly wouldn't rely on the exporter to provide the information themselves. It's not in their, their, their interest to do so if they've got hazardous material in there. Uh, and, and, and so if it comes down to those sorts of questions, it would be entailing the precautionary principle would be to prohibit the material from entering the country mm -hmm. under any circumstances. And the best way uh, to do that would uh, have clear, definitive statements through the Basel Convention about what this material actually is, what it constitutes, uh, and what the potential is for it to be hazardous. And Jim uh, mentioned a number of the clauses uh, that uh, could be used uh, to make a very clear statement uh, about the nature of this material. And at the moment, it's left completely opaque. Uh, it's uh, very, very difficult uh, to actually define uh, refuse-derived fuel or process-engineered fuel through the convention. And there's new names being developed for these materials on what seems like a weekly basis. So all sorts of companies will develop their own names around certain types of fuel. There, there don't seem to be many international standards that apply, although in Europe, they, for the inter-European trade, they do have some standards and they do have some, uh, uh, if you like, um, some limits that apply to contents of material in them, such as chloride and mercury, mm -hmm. uh, mainly because it could damage the cement kiln. Uh, it's not so much about uh, whether it represents uh, hazardous waste for human health. So I, I think the clear thing would be to have agreement at the Basel Convention with all parties taking part, negotiated transparently, uh, to establish exactly what this material is and how it should be handled. That would be the, the best solution. Okay, uh, another challenge we are, we are having. Um, Speak louder, sir. Okay, another challenge we also face, um, some uh, private sector operators uh, in the country um, come to us and tell us that they are being offered um, some sort of incentive by developed countries they want to establish um, um, facilities, yes. you know, to produce RDF in the country, in our own country. And of course, the condition is that we will allow a waste, you know, to come into the country to be handled by the facilities they are going to establish. They will fund everything. And we're saying, no, <laughs> do that in your country. You know, you have the capacity. Uh, we don't, we're grappling even with the waste that we generate look at, exactly. we have not been able to deal with that. And so we don't want to get involved, you know, with waste that are coming from outside the country. Mm -hmm. And also, we wonder at times, 
Why is it difficult for the developed countries or countries that where the RODF is being produced? Why is it difficult for them to use the RODF in their countries? Sorry, cement uh, plants and so on to use those RODF in their countries instead of pushing those RODF to um, to developing uh, countries. And I, I agree with uh, Jim. I, I think we should look at uh, the possibility of addressing this issue under the auspices of the Basel and ban it totally. Yes. Yeah, thank you for your insight, sir. Um, you, you who are still with us, fortunately, would like to also share an insight on your questions. Yes, uh, thank you so much. It's an interesting topic to discuss. and. I think it should be first. Of, first of all, it has to be clarified under Basel. What are the HS code uh, considered for PEF and RDF? Because at the moment, as um, Magus already mentioned, and also Lee, and based on our observation, also there are a lot of HS codes as an entry point uh, for for waste uh, as RDF. But uh, I think, Jim, we will be rely on you to uh, push for this issue to be clarified at the Basel Convention. Uh, so it will be, uh, so parties especially, will have a clear idea what, which HS codes actually supposed to be prohibited. Um, in Indonesia at the moment, there is no prohibitions to import um, 3825, although our law, um, the Indonesian law already prohibited the importations of waste. Um, in regards with plastics and paper, the importations, the, the, the category and the name of um, HS 3, uh, 30, 3915 and 4707 for paper crafts has been, uh, the regulation has been titled uh, importing waste as um, raw material for industry, uh, industrial processes. So that's how they can enter into the country. However, the RDF policy in every country should be really, really restricted and if possible, no uh, regulatory support for RDF because you will open the Pandora box uh, because uh, once you introduce the RDF idea as an alternative fuel in developing countries, it will create another hell <laughs> because we don't have, uh, mostly most developing countries do not have the capacity for the laboratory to monitor the, the POPs and new POPs and um, cannot anticipate um, the waste entering into the country uh, in the form of mixed waste. So I can, um, I would like to praise the government of Kenya for saying no, and I hope you remain saying no for that. And I hope also other countries, um, because there are a lot of incentives. Nigeria. 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 I'm sorry, Nigeria. Thank you. Um, and also for exporters, um, um, Jim mentioned this, I guess, in, in, the, in the, his presentations that the declaration, um, and also my guess, the declaration of uh, the bill of lading when they sent the shipment to a particular country will, it could be manipulated or it could be uh, misdeclared and we will only find out what's in it, what's inside the containers after we open it, you know. So there will be no mechanism to find out what's inside the containers unless the shipments was written by, you know, uh, um, an honest officer uh, of the shipping agency. Um, so it's every everybody play their part um, to disguise this sh shipment. So I think it's it has to be um, uh, stricter uh, and and strengthened uh, the the check at the port and also um, the shipping the shipping company and then at the ports also um, the customs uh, have to be strengthened. But 
one uh, first and foremost is the government regulations. Uh, please do not allow them to enter your country. Thank you. Thank you, Yu Yun, and thank you, sir. Um, so we'll entertain one question from our online participants from Fernando Bejarano to all our panelists. Hi, Fernando. <laughs> we miss you here. Uh, so what are the consequences, actually for Jim, what are the consequences of the USA as non-party of the Basel Convention and as a big exporter um, of plastic waste? What are the challenges for the countries that are receiving the waste and that are parties? Sure. So the other um, ban that's been in the convention since the beginning is that it's forbidden for parties to trade with non-parties. There's one exception to that. If you establish an Article 11 agreement in a bilateral or multilateral way, then you can bring in non-parties. But that agreement has to be the environmental equivalent of Basel. It can't be weaker. So there is an equivalent agreement, at least the uh, people that are using it purported to be, and that's the OECD agreement. Um, so sometimes the U.S. can trade in plastics, for example, um, normally they would with other OECD countries. But in the case of the U.S., after these plastic amendments were adopted, they objected to them, and they went to the OECD and said, we don't like these new amendments. And so the ironic thing is the OECD said, okay, we're not going to allow them to be traded in the OECD regime. So the U.S. was locked out of it, and Basel still applies. So right now, with the U.S., they're not allowed to trade in this new dirty and mixed plastic Y48 with anybody except Canada. They've created an agreement with Canada. So I know Fernando's in Mexico right now. We're having a discussion because we've just looked into the exports from the USA to Mexico, and they should not be happening at all if it's Y48 or one, one of the listings of plastic you know is going to be uh, Y48 is PVC. And PVC does, does have an HS code, so we've identified PVC shipments going to Mexico. Totally illegal. And Mexico, right now, is allowing this to come in. So this is a big problem. So I've written to the government of Mexico to try to get their explanation before hammering them here at the meeting. Uh, I've been waiting for a letter from them for several days that they were going to send before the meeting ended, um, hopefully before it started. But uh, I think they're having trouble answering the question because I think we clearly caught them importing illegally. This is not a one-off case. The U.S. is moving Y48 and PVC all over the world. In fact, uh, if you come Monday, um, gentlemen from Nigeria, we're going to be having a, uh, another talk Monday night, and we'll show the evidence of PVC being exported to your country. Um, the actual bills awaiting printouts. So you really got to watch the situation of the U.S. And why you do is because the, their exporters have no liability. They're not part a party, so the U.S. is not going to punish them. They're not, you know, anything liable for them to export. It's free trade out of the U.S. So this is a real problem. So we have the most wasteful country on the planet, uh, not part of this treaty. So we really have to uphold our end of it in the receiving countries and just say no. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Yes, thank you, Leah. Just to add on the, what the Jim had to say, uh, we, we noticed in the in Africa, that uh, most of the countries that are target or maybe export or, or import of hazardous waste are the countries that are not party to the Bamako Convention. Because even e waste is targeting Nigeria and uh, maybe uh, Ghana too. If you look at the map, these countries are not party to the, uh, to the, battle, to the Bamako Convention. So I think it, one way will be maybe for those countries to uh, become party to the Basel, to the Bamako Convention. So, uh, yeah, just <laughs> to, to you know the fight we have. So, Nigeria? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Because even this uh, the trader, they know, because they, they, 
we see how this helped Tunisia to, to solve the problem they had because uh, they pay huge uh, compensation to, to Tunisia because they they bring out the, the Bamako Convention, they are party to the Bamako Convention. So this is one of the things we should consider. Yeah, but let me just say something. I, um, although, yes, we need to ratify, we don't actually, in the case of uh, e-waste, even plastic waste, we don't allow such to come into the country. And if there's any um, import into the country, what it means is that it's, it is illegal. And we know that there have been cases we are even the customs, you know, they have intercepted such uh, shipments into, into the country. But for us, because we operate a permitting uh, a system, we don't issue uh, licenses for the import of plastic or e waste into the country. Thank you. Um, we have time for maybe just two more questions. Um, We'll take one from from our online um, audience. So this one first, sorry, um, from Enham. How can how can we prevent our countries from the illegal traffic and trade without POPs laboratories to identify the contents of POPs in the waste? Yeah. You know, everybody's now heard of the national sword that China put in place, that policy. But what is right under everyone's nose is that there was a reason they did what they did. It was a self-serving reason. They did the calculus after being the world's most dominant importer of waste for so many years, and they were extracting value from the waste. But they did the calculus and they realized that there was more liabilities and negative impacts that, than there was value. They did the economic ecological economic assessment and realize this is not paying off the long-term cost for our country, the loss of our groundwater, our population's getting sick. We don't need this anymore. They, they actually didn't do it just to be nice. So this applies to every country and people are forgetting that. They're just looking at the results of the chaos when they made that decision, but it was a very calculated decision and it applies to every country. These things are costing your, your country much more than you benefit from it. So really think about that. What China did, that's the lesson there. So to answer your question, don't worry about laboratory analysis. Say no solid waste, no hazardous waste can come into the country. Saves you a lot of money on laboratory analysis. Prevention is better than cure. So if uh, you can block the imports that you suspect are highly likely to contain these materials. And these days you have things like, you know, PFAS products in, in food wrappers and, uh, you know, brominated flame retardants in household goods, furnishing. Half of the textiles now are made of plastics that contain PFAS treatments. We know it's all there. We know it's going into household waste. When you shred it into small particles, it's very difficult to tell it apart until you use uh, sophisticated analytical equipment. So the precautionary principle dictates that you stop this material before it reaches your border. Uh, and that's essentially what we're saying that the Basel Convention uh, needs to uh, make very clear uh, in the technical guidelines and in the, in the annexes that relate to this. But governments shouldn't wait necessarily for the outcomes of the Basel Convention processes, they can act unilaterally and protect their own borders. And China has. Thank you. And uh, so the, the question came from Enham Refat, Stockholm Convention focal point for Egypt. So thank you for your question, sir. And maybe one final question before the closing remarks from our speakers. Yes. Okay, thank you for giving me the floor. Um, I'm Hamad Joda, Focal Point Basel Convention for Cameroon. Yeah, uh, for us, the main challenge we are facing is the illegal trade. Because even uh, a part of the uh, uh, Bamako Convention, our regulation have already banned the importation of any waste. 
But how can we control all importations importations of uh, EDF? Is our main challenge we are facing. Because somebody can declare uh, wrong information on the waste uh, they are. Well, when it comes to an enforcement, the first thing you got to be sure your country has done yeah. is not just ratify the convention, but put it into the national law. Yeah. When you do that, you have the legal ability to really prosecute. Yeah, we, we, we ratify. Yeah, yeah, I know. Ratification is step one, yeah. but put it into your national law so that you, your prosecutors can actually do something with it. Now, technically, ratifying should be enough, but when it comes down to a legal battle, if you don't have it in your national law, it's going to be really tough. So I don't know if Cameroon does or not. Um, but the other thing to remember that Basel is really good and it says illegal traffic is a criminal act. So when it's a criminal act, you put people in jail. And if you really start to punish people, this thing will dry up really quickly. Uh, we had a situation in the US where a lot of electronic waste was flying off the shore, right? And our GPS trackers caught out a recycler and those two executives for that company had to go to jail for 28 months each. And this is at a country that doesn't even have the Basel Convention to back it up. It was, it was based on fraud. So fraud law is there for you. But when you're a Basel party, make this a criminal act and have the punishments actually mean that it, they're getting criminally punished. So not just a slap on the wrist or a fine, people having to do real jail time. And I wish I could say that the U.S., my country, that these people should be liable. We're working on that <laughs> for a long time, uh, using fraud law or trying to get the, the U.S. to ratify the convention. But um, you, it really does make a difference to prosecute the crimes. So, yes, thank you for your questions. Uh, may I now request our speakers for a brief closing message? You no, know, you want to leave you know, uh, to our audience as their take home. Uh, I might just start with that. And my, my first comment would be uh, that uh, we need to talk to the Australian government, the new government in Australia, uh, and move away from these uh, cynical export models uh, of uh, waste recycling and waste movement. Uh, and we need to deal with our own waste at home, because if you don't start dealing with your own waste domestically, you don't you don't develop the means to do it. It's politically lazy to allow exports of materials <coughs> to other countries uh, who aren't in a position to deal with it properly. We're a developed country. We have the material resources. We have uh, the financial resources and the technical capacity to deal with the waste ourselves, and we should do that. And so I think that all countries need to look into what they can do themselves for their own waste streams and, and avoid dumping waste on other countries as a short-term uh, politically lazy measure. Uh, so the precautionary principle will protect uh, countries who want to implement border controls and prevent these wastes coming in to some extent. Uh, but as Jim mentioned, there will always be some forms of illegal trade uh, and sometimes you need to carry a big stick in relation to these issues and I would encourage countries to do so. Thank you. Um, Yuyun, your brief uh, closing message, please. Yes. Um, my my message is that um, to remind all of us, and especially delegates, uh, government uh, officials, that RDF is only a different form of pollution, um, but it's even worse because it's converted the visible waste into the invisible one because you can't see the pollution and it's up to the air and it's even worse uh, it will be inhaled by people 24 hours so um, RDF should not be considered as the best environmental practices um, and following the precautionary principle is best and improve your waste management system uh, that's the best and also please prohibit the importation of RDF or municipal waste uh, in various codes, uh, 3825, 3606690, um, 3915900. So everything with 90 at the back is going to be a mix of everything. So um, good luck and, and stay strong.
Thank you. Thank you, Yuyun. Yeah. Okay, I concur with uh, Lee and Yuyun, but also want to um, no, to caution you. RDF is also coming in through paper imports, mm. paper waste imports. Yeah, because there is residual waste in the paper waste imports, like plastic waste. And uh, we can see from the paper mills in Malaysia itself, they have already started uh, uh, on-site incinerators to, uh, yeah, because of the residual waste, they will turn it into RTFs and co-firing in the incinerator, incinerators. So um, the thing is, we need to reduce the waste that we are generating. So that's my final message. Thank you, I guess. Jim? So, yeah, I've, I've had a few uh, points to make already, but I'll just add, go back to plastics. Because why this is happening is we've been producing way too many plastics. And as you, we begin to expose the problems with plastics and how they're inherently not circular, the recycling part of it is getting more and more pressure. So if you put your mind into the industry and was realizing they want to triple the amount of plastic they want to produce in the next 10 years. Their only way out, because it's going to be shown more and more, the recycling is bankrupt. It just doesn't work. We only recycled 9%. That's even inflated for all this time in history. Their only way out is to say that burning it is a green thing to do. And it's not. So. Any scheme that's going to burn plastics or any kind of waste, in my view, it's got to be looked at with great skepticism. And this is their, their Achilles heel is they don't have an end of life strategy, except for burning it. This is why we have RDF. So be aware. Thank you. Our dear speakers, let's give them again a round of applause. So the video of this side event will be available in the IPAN website, also the BRS website, and in the Geneva Environment Network website, which will also include the slides. So watch out uh, for that. Um, so thank you all once again for coming, and thank you for your kind attention, and um, take care on your way home later tonight, and have a good night. Thank you. We have here other side events scheduled. For the next few days and even next week, please uh, watch out for them and do attend them.